Hello friends, we're going to now continue our work on unpacking uh, Buddhist doctrine with respect to the meditation experience. And that meditation experience that we're, we've been discussing has primarily been the jhanas, which uh, as I've um, demonstrated, I believe, uh, in this series, video series, is that jhana is really an ecstatic altered state of consciousness that's characterized by bliss joy and ecstasy, and is not at all um, just the cognitive uh, exercise of concentration. Now there's a few other um, uh, Buddhist priests who uh, describe jhana in other ways that are somewhat, perhaps, charismatic. One is, uh, is a Buddhist priest has been describing the first jhana as the arising of a luminous sphere or a charismatic luminous sphere, something that arises inside the meditation. Now I've seen the luminous sphere and a number of my uh, subjects in my case histories have also seen the luminous sphere. However, that luminous sphere for us arises after the fourth jhana. So we believe that this particular individual uh, is probably mistaken in his understanding of what jhana really is. Uh, particularly if we look at the discourses of the Buddha, there's no place in the discourses of the Buddha where we can uh, point to a discourse that clearly describes a luminous sphere arising during meditation. Yes, there are references to luminosity and uh, light as a vehicle of liberation, and I suspect that the luminous sphere is, uh, is one of the manifestations of light, However, that light usually occurs after the fourth jhana. So we really have to understand what is jhana because the Buddha did not even recognize that he was enlightened until he had figured out the four jhanas. And, uh, and getting there is uh, we have to be we have to exercise some uh, logic and critical thinking and a comparative analysis because apparently nobody in Buddhism really understands what jhana is. And if none of them know what jhana is, then they don't know what the Eighth Fold or the Noble Eightfold Path is, which means, you know, that hardly anybody who claims to call themselves a Buddhist understands the Noble Eightfold Path. Isn't that kind of funny? Okay, well, that's the way it is. So then, uh, then we have another uh, priest who's gotten a lot of mileage out of claiming that there's not just four jhanas, but there's 48 different jhanas. And his angle on jhana is that he's got something called mundane versus super mundane jhana, or uh, vipassana jhanas versus shamatha jhanas, uh, and he also has stream winner jhanas, and once returner jhanas, and non returner jhanas, and arhat jhanas. Well, there's no place in the discourses of the Buddha that describes any more than four jhanas. There's none of the language of mundane versus super mundane jhana. There's no, none of the language of vipassana jhana versus shamatha jhana. And uh, there's no uh, you know, set of four jhanas for each of the noble attainments. Arhat versus stream winner versus once returner and, and non-returner. Okay, so we can. Uh, oh, and by the way, the source for these ideas of 48 different jhanas happens to be the commentaries of the Vasudhimagga and the Abhidhamma. Now, if the Vasudhimagga and the Abhidhamma uh, express, let's say, 48 different jhanas, then we have to conclude that the that these commentaries, the Vasudhimagga and the Abhidhamma are an unreliable source of information because, as, I, as I've said, the discourses of the Buddha uh, describe none of this. So I think we have to conclude that the Vasudhimagga and the Abhidhamma are uh, unreliable sources of information or should be just re disregarded. And we should go back to looking at the discourses of the Buddha. And we should also question the translators who are translating our, uh, the discourses of the Buddha for us because if they're translating jhana as nothing more than concentration, then they have no idea what jhana is. Okay, thank you, friends, and have a wonderful week.